So, what is a cave? Some people think it's just a big hole in the side of a mountain. Mm -mm. It's way more complex than that. First of all, not all caves are created equal. You have glacial caves where meltwater squeezes through cracks in glaciers, slowly widening them to create these beautiful stream-filled, gravel-bedded, gorgeous types of caverns. They're fantastic to explore. You gotta go somewhere where there's glaciers to see those. Maybe a glacial park up in Montana. That might be a good place to start. Or you can also have what are called primary caves. A primary cave is a cave that forms at the same time that the rock forms that surrounds it. For instance, lava tubes. You have lava that's flowing in, it gets all crusty on top, and that insulates the lava underneath, so the lava underneath continues to flow, and eventually when it flows out, it leaves behind this large tube that contained the lava. If you wanna see some of those, you can go to um, Craters of the Moon National Monument in Idaho. And when they say Craters of the Moon, they're not kidding. It looks just like the surface of the moon. You can also have solution caves. Now a solution cave is the same kind of cave that we have here mostly in the southeastern United States. Almost all we have here are solution caves. These are caves that are created as rainwater percolates through the ground and gets into cracks in limestones and slowly dissolves that limestone to open up that space into a large area that would be a cave or a cavern. And once you can get into it, that's when you begin to see all the beautiful things. Caves are great examples of weathering, erosion, and deposition. You have the weathering, which opens up the cave. You have erosion as the material that's being dissolved gets transported away from the cave. And then eventually you have deposition in the formation of the speleothems. That's all the beautiful cave formations that we're gonna be seeing in a few minutes. The cave we're going into today is an amazing cave. It's called DeSoto Caverns. It's right here in Childersburg, Alabama. And it's one of the most beautiful caves we've ever been in, I've ever been in. Brought my family here a bunch. It's a fantastic place. So let's go check it out. Caves are a surprising place to find an ecosystem. I mean, how can you have a food web without sunlight? There's no sunlight in a cave. Could animals play a role in this? Or is there something else that's even more important than animals? Let's find out. So here's a little vocabulary for you, right? The term troglozine, the term troglophile, troglobite, and troglodyte. You can probably figure out by now, troglo has something to do with being underground and being in the darkness all the time. That's exactly right. It's like caves and stuff, right? But troglozine, a troglozine is an organism that lives kind of on the outside, maybe in the cave mouth, every now and then might come in or whatever. They contribute to the ecology of a cave because they might come in and die and things can eat them in the cave. Or they might come in and go to the bathroom and things can eat that in the cave. That's a possibility. Then you have the troglophile. File, filios means love. These are cave loving animals. These are things like bats and other things that love to live in caves, but they can survive just fine out in the light. So these animals also will come in, will die, will go to the bathroom and contribute to the ecosystem of the cave. Now, a troglobite, a troglobite is an organism that has adapted so intensely to life in the dark that it can no longer exist out in the sunlight. So these, these animals are locked in the caves for their whole life. They really never ever leave them. They can't, they would die. That's a troglobite. So then what's a troglodyte? Well, a troglodyte is a mythological creature. They really don't exist. It's these creepy things that kind of live around in caves according to mythology. But I don't think they're real. But just in case, uh, maybe we should move on. So, the primary way that we can get nutrients into a cave in order to set up that food web, get the foundation of that food web going, is actually water coming in from the surface. As this water comes in, it is pulling detritus. That's all the leaves and twigs and sticks and rotten dead bodies and stuff like that that are all decomposing on the surface where rainwater hits, begins to pull those things through, it dissolves a lot of that nutrients with it. 
brings it down into the cave, oftentimes washing leaves and actually bits of pieces with it. Now as that comes down, it's not only carrying that detritus, but it's also carrying spores from funguses, it's carrying bacteria. They begin to munch on the detritus that's here in the cave. That then begins the food for cave crickets and centipedes and other insects. And that becomes the food for things like salamanders and bats and other things that would live in this cave. So the real foundation for cave ecosystems is the detritus washing in from outside. So in a sense, sunlight is reaching the cave, even in the darkest parts. And it's reaching it because it's flowing in from all the stuff that was photosynthesizing on the surface. That's how we get sunlight into the back part of a cave. But it's more than just a lack of sunlight that makes caves interesting habitats. What about the fact that their temperature rarely changes? So, when you're this far down under the earth, pretty much the temperature is constant. Here in DeSoto Caverns, the back of the cave is a constant 60 degrees, 60 degrees Fahrenheit all year round. So how then is it in the summertime when you come into a cave, it feels cold, but in the wintertime you come into the same cave, it's still 60 degrees, but it feels warm. Well, here's an experiment I want you to try. I want you to set up a sink of hot water, as hot, as hot of water as you can stand it in your kitchen sink. And next to that, I want you to have a bowl of room temperature water. And next to that, I want you to have a bowl of ice water. Got it? Hot water, room temperature water, ice water. Once you have that established, I want you to put one hand in the hot water and one hand in the ice water, and I want you to hold them there for as long as you can. 30 seconds, 45 seconds, a minute, as long as you can. And as soon as you can't stand it, take them both out and put them both into the room temperature water. And what you'll notice is that the hand that was in the ice water, the room temperature water will feel warm, and the hand that was in the hot water, the room temperature water will feel cold, even though it's the same temperature. Same thing is going on in the atmosphere as you're walking from a hot summer day into a cave versus a cold winter day into a cave. See how that works? Try that experiment. So as this water is dripping down, it's not only carrying nutrients and other things down to form an ecosystem, but it's also carrying dissolved limestone. That's calcium carbonate. You see, whenever rain falls from the atmosphere, it's picking up small trace amounts of carbon dioxide. When it hits the ground, it picks up nitrogen compounds. And what this does is it makes the rainwater slightly acidic. You have carbonic acid, you have nitric acid that are all dripping down and getting into this limestone. Well, limestone dissolves in acid. Limestone's a base, calcium carbonate's a base, and acids, acids and base dissolve to form salt and water. And that's what's happening as this stuff drips through. Now the cool thing is, as this is dripping through, carrying down that calcium carbonate, if that water gets to sit for any length of time, it's going to begin to evaporate into the atmosphere of the cave. As it evaporates, it leaves behind the calcium carbonate. So, as it begins to drip down here, as it drips down here, it's leaving behind. You can see the shine on this rock. It's wet. It's really wet. And as it comes down, it's evaporating off and it leaves the calcium carbonate, creating a layer of limestone on the outside of these things. As it drips down onto these structures, it splashes, makes it wet, and it evaporates from here, and it creates more structures. Sometimes the structures can grow together. The three basic, simple types of speleothems or cave formations are the stalactites, the stalagmites, and the columns. So we have stalactite, it's on the ceiling, hanging on tight, right? The stalagmite is mighty because it's growing up from underneath. And then the column is where those two join together. These are the base, but that's not the only structure. You can have draperies, you can have 
flow stones. You can have rhinestone dams. You can have all kinds of amazing bottle brush structures. Things called bottle brushes. Amazingly beautiful structures. You need to find a cave as soon as you can and get into it and check those things out. I would like to recommend DeSoto Caverns where we are today, where we are today. Check it out. It's an amazing place to come. So, by the way, I'm not touching these formations. And you'll be told that when you go into caves. Don't touch the formation, right? They're not just giving you rules that you have to follow. The reason is, is you have oil on your skin, and oil and water don't mix. So when you touch, when there's a lot of formations that people are touching, the oil gets trapped onto the formation, it repels the water, and it actually changes the way that speleothem is going to grow. It changes it. It alters it. And we want to try to keep things in caves as natural as possible. So respect the rules. Don't touch. There's a reason for it. Caves are such incredibly diverse habitats. They are definitely on the list of Alabama's most extreme ecosystems. Wow, what an amazing cave. I want to give special thanks to Alan Danielle, to Joy and Jared for letting me come in on this day when right now the cave is closed because of COVID-19, but they allowed me to come anyway to shoot this amazing place and to share it with you guys. Hey, if you guys are looking for something to do, because you're going a little bit, got a little bit of cabin fever going on right now. If you're looking for something to do this summer, you got to come down to Childersburg and check out uh, DeSoto Caverns. It's amazing. They not, they don't just have the cave, although that's alone by itself is worth the price of admission. But they also have a large maze that you can run around. They've got gem mining. They've got archery. They even have a brand new blacksmith place that they've just put in. You've got to come down and check this out. It is a fantastic. I've been here several times with my family. It is one of the most amazing places to come. Woo! It's breezy today. Today would be a great day to bring my family, but I can't. We're still in our quarantine from COVID-19. That's okay. We'll come back here this summer for sure. Maybe I'll even see you here. If not, say hey to Hal Al and Danielle Mathis. Say hey to Joy and Jared Sorensen. Tell them I sent you. Tell them I said thank you for letting me come. In the meantime, if you want more of really cool education materials about DeSoto Caverns, check out the comments below and I've got a hyperlink that will take you to their website. They have tons of educational materials, videos, uh, quizzes, anything you would want if you're a homeschooler to have some extracurricular stuff going on about caves. But if you can, come down here this summer for sure. It is worth it. Your family will love it.